it is time. Time for another episode of The Future of Photography. My name is Chris Marquardt, and we have Imar, Adrian, and Jeremiah. Hello there. Hello. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so Hello. we have, um, yeah, another another exciting episode. The title, um, I, I like the title. Uh, Adrian, I think you chose the title, False Positives. And uh, Indeed. What, what triggered this episode was an article that um, I think I came across. Um, it's, a, it's an article in Petapixel where some software called Gigapixel AI, which is there to up photos, was inserting Ryan Gosling's face into a photo. <laughs> and that, I found that very interesting. So I put it in, in, our, um, mm. in our little uh, Discord channel where we discuss new episodes. And uh, this is the episode that developed out of it. So let's see where we'll take it. Adrian, um, you have you have uh, been so uh, wonderful to prepare this. So uh, wow, it, took me down a back, it took me down a bit of a rabbit hole, actually, um, <laughs> because there's so many what? stories uh, on this uh, this topic. So I, I, I will caveat the whole of the next discussion by saying that, you know, the, the few examples that we'll talk about seem to be really just the tip of the iceberg. And there's just so much you could you, you could report on in this area. Um, but to go back to our absolute basics, um, what we're going to talk about today is that uh, the way that software for facial recognition can get it wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And partic particularly uh, false positives where the software says one thing, but the thing that it says is incorrect. Um, that could be a, a false identification. It could be a false um, a, a false assignment of gender to to a facial image, all sorts of ways in which it could go wrong. Um, the, the funny story up front, right, adding Ryan Gosling's face to a photo. Um, do you know what? Uh, I think there's a little bit of clickbait in this from somebody somewhere along the line because <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, and and I know I get confused between the two Ryans. There's Ryan Gosling as the and as the other one, and and I always get confused which one is which. Reynolds. Reynolds, thank you, Jeremiah. Um, but and and they, and they both have made some excellent movies over the last ten, fifteen years. Um, uh, I love The Notebook, um, but don't tell anybody I said that. And I also <laughs> love. Good thing we're not recording. Good thing we're not recording. And I also love Deadpool. Right, so that's both the Ryans as far as I can figure out. Um, but this is a this is a uh, th this is this was an image um, where there was no face actually. It was it was just an arrangement of uh, some it looked something sort of abstracty or maybe metal girders or something like that. And the software added Ryan Gosling's face to it. They say it didn't look like him to me, but there you go. Anyway, point is uh, that uh, some of this stuff can have quite um, quite far-reaching consequences in law enforcement and safety um, in all sorts of areas, really. Um, and I thought it was worth a bit of a chat about it. Um, so, a couple of examples. Um, uh, hands up, who knew that uh, the Metropolitan Police in London actually do use facial recognition? Uh, as I do think I knew that, yeah. You knew that, Okay. Oh, Jeremiah knew that as well. Hands up. Mm. Probably shouldn't say hands up on an audio podcast. <laughs> Good job we've got a video <laughs> feed as well. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and it has had um, uh, some mixed successes. Um, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a link in the show notes for, for that. Um, hands up who saw the recent story in San Francisco where the, the local government uh, for one of a, a term that i don't know there actually recently banned facial recognition technology uh, in mm. public yep hands yes. up from here okay mm -hmm. excellent that was a nodding as well on the on, on, the, <laughs> another on the audio yeah yeah, yeah that's a nodding this, this <laughs> an audio. um uh, can i um just add a, a small point um are you guys aware of the company called palantir oh yes yes big in the defense so, industry yeah, I mean, these are all very insider, not good people, as far as I'm concerned. There goes oh my, my God. They're all the company me. name alone yeah. does not suggest good things, does it? But uh, <laughs> imagine, imagine it's if from you the Lord will, of the Rings, isn't it? Scrubbing, amongst other places, yes. 
Imagine scrubbing the internet with everybody's posting with their all their selfies of which we have covered um, all of their family, all of the identification, all of the um, the way that you can identify people even in your database, which is uploaded to the cloud uh, in terms of recognizing faces. Well, uh, you have a company that that kind of scrubs the internet and associates uh, image with names and through names, addresses, demographic, all of those things, and they do it globally. So whereas, whereas a police department could say, no, we do not use this internally, um, there have been uh, instances, many, um, certainly here, where they would just hire Palantir or, or side view it's not there's a lot of um, conversation about that right now so while it's not it's outsourcing facial recognition and in many ways uh, this could be maybe even more dangerous than the government and I'll explain why it's because Palantir may have um, less problems with resources than a local government or a local police department um, in terms of um, amassing a significant database, uh, whereas a private company who is selling this for all manner of reasons, not just law enforcement, but all manner of things, uh, that could be uh, significant. So I just draw that to our attention as we kind of discuss the uses and who uses it. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's not long. You don't have to think very far or very many steps down the logical path to start getting quite frightened by some of this stuff. Um, and, and at this point, as we record this uh, in the second half of 2020, um, you know, I think it's acknowledged that there are many companies out there collecting those data um, uh, and that uh, not everybody that uses that data necessarily is using it in conjunction with the relevant civil rights for, for, the, for the region it's used in. Um, and that is worrying and that there is there is definitely um, uh there are definitely issues there and as that i think that's I, I would like to talk about that not so much necessarily the uh potential for uh for, for who, sorry that not necessarily who who's using it or what the technologies are but actually the potential for for one of a better term societal harm um or and, and harm to individuals as well for when this goes wrong because depending on where you read uh the, the statistics on the performance of uh, this technology is, um, it, it, it is, it varies. Statistics vary and it's not always easy to find a clear picture of the truth. Uh, but one thing that most reports agree on is that the number of false positives is higher than is useful. Um, we've probably heard a lot about false positives this year in terms of COVID testing um, and the harm that they can do. Uh, so, so maybe as a topic, it's it's uh, has more visibility or is more on people's minds this year than perhaps it's been in the past. Um, but we're talking here about software that could, in, in you know, quite a large number of situations, um, identify the wrong person as a criminal, for example, or uh, or or identify a person at all. I mean, this is kind of the funny thing That's true, that, yeah. that, that puts this episode for me somewhere in between the societal uh, issues and the technical issues because what yeah. happened with uh, the, the thing that triggered this episode was that uh, the software increases the resolution of photos and it doesn't do this by the normal ordinary means, but it uses AI for it. So it looks at things it recognizes mm -hmm. and then fills in the blanks when it upraises things so that uh, like, 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 let's say the, the, the feathers on a bird, it will fill that with feathers of a bird, but maybe not exactly the same feathers that were there originally, but it will still do it. And uh, and the reason why a face showed up in an uprest photo where none was initially was because it the, the software found a pattern that reminded it of a face and this way it it just filled in a face that whoever wrote that headline um, thinks looks like Ryan Gosling. So the, the it's it's a really interesting um, technological issue at first. But then, of course, it uh, will 
add uh, questions in other areas. Um, the other thing I brought up, and that's probably four or five years ago, was the Xerox um, issue that w went along the same lines, um, where the software would use some compression algorithms to like have those copies stored in between like uh, you could copy something and then you could just print another one of it later on and that and that storage was so compressed that uh, the software tried to guess what numbers were on that paper and then printed the wrong numbers out so you get um, you, you can easily paint an interesting picture of a uh, an application where some financial data gets copied and then the numbers get changed and then the books don't match anymore and and so on or medical data or something so from that that turns very quickly from a societal from, from a technological thing into a societal thing and i think that's well, yeah. also uh if i may the the um racial characteristics are significant oh, yes. um, false positives in uh, they found uh, people of color are are more likely to be misidentified, and part of that could be the how these um, uh, pieces of software are are taught, how the AI is taught in terms of um, the input of images and how they're assigned uh, identities. And um, there's been a lot of discussion and articles about uh, sort of racial characteristics or in you know in, um, the kind of uh, racism that's inherent certainly in this country as being part of the flaw of the input sessions. So naturally, the characteristics of the learning are flawed. Um, it's the data so, sets that that uh, determine yeah. how good the AI will be when recognizing yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, have you used the Audubon app? Anybody? Emer? Mm -hmm. I know what you the Audubon is, but <laughs> no. They, they've uh, released an app and it, you can like take a picture of a bird and it'll tell you what kind of bird um not oh, okay. being a birder in any way um they'll look like they have wings and i can identify <laughs> the local birds are have, you gonna I say mean, they all look the same to me <laughs> <laughs> well they all have wings they seem to fly okay you're not allowed to do the facial recognition now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want input from me. But, but, yeah. but um, you know, I know my local five birds that are around. But what I'm really saying is that is supposed to be very, very accurate. I haven't used it, and I have no way of knowing if it's, if it's true. But, uh, it, you know, so there's that. And, of course, yes. there's plant identifiers uh, as well and translation identifiers all sort of offshoots of machine learning so so i would say though that if you're trying to identify a bird um you're identifying at the species level mm. um you're not identifying at the individual level right. um so you know there, there there are there's a challenge there what i would suggest is that uh, um everybody uh who listens to this the, there's a really great uh link in the show notes um it's to a uh a presentation i guess a, a keynote speech kind of thing from a, a lady whose surname i'm, I'm afraid i'm probably going to get wrong um, okay it, it's bualam bualamwini i practice how to say that because it's a lovely name um <laughs> Thank she's you. a really really interesting character um guys um she started off um she was doing an art project which is how she kind of got into this kind of space of doing this in the first place. And she uh, she had a camera set up and um, it was like an art project that was like a mirror, a projection mirror so that um, when you looked into the camera that it would throw you back something that you wanted to look like. In her case, she said it was Serena Williams. That's what she wanted to see looking back at her. But um, she tried it out in loads of her friends of different ethnicities and stuff and she discovered that it couldn't see her face a lot of the time at all it just didn't pick her face out and then she just started to investigate that deeper and discovered that um women of color particularly um turned up often uh, being identified as male um mm. in a huge percentages so that kind of uh opened up this whole um obviously took her down her own rabbit hole and um, she's kind of working on a PhD on all this stuff now and she discovered that the benchmark like you were saying there with the data sets 
that they just it, there wasn't a broad enough spectrum she discovered so she she set up her own benchmark using um as many tones as she could and she sort of used um uh, governments uh, and she picked governments and apparently the highest representation of uh, females in government uh, in Africa or in that region is um, in Rwanda and so she took Rwanda uh, uh, on one end sort of and then on the other end she took some of the Scandinavian countries that had a good gender balance in there as well and she um, managed to make massive uh, differences when she ran those through um, uh, what the various different ones she she used the one face plus plus from china and she's an ibm one yeah and, and a microsoft um, one as well she had she, so she built her own data set as you say and then yeah, she tested that yeah, against yeah. three market leading facial recognition products from microsoft uh, uh the face yeah. plus plus is a product name i forget the i forget the company that is uh that, that makes it but then ibm mm. as well you know, they've both uh, decided not to uh, sell facial res recognition software anymore. IBM, That's um, uh, particularly encouraging. Announced that uh, last week that they would not do it. Mm. Amazon as well. Mm. Um, they both are into, you know, they have some, some deep learning. You know, is the, you know there, we've come to a fork in the road about this, though. Mm. There is the problem one of computing power and input and algorithms that that can get more accurate that's one thing and is mm. that a good thing or do we want it at all which is mm. more to the general conversation and mm. what does that do if it had a hundred percent accuracy i mean do you guys have ring doorbells um where, where you are is that is mm -hmm. that a thing we we yeah. could here in germany we could have them but i refuse to put any of that on my door i've read the stories about ring and the involvement of the police using the data and that kind of stuff it, it, it's crazy also i have i have uh in 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 my house i have a doorbird which is a, I believe a german company uh, never heard of them similar. But anyway very very similar you know um, a little more sophisticated in terms of its uh, integration point is uh if your ring cameras which create a a a massive kind of social dynamic of paranoia and have because everything is with their neighbors um software where everyone any kind of package theft or people walking by or it increases paranoia uh, the argument is it also increases awareness of what's going on in your neighborhood. If you couple that with facial recognition, uh, I can't imagine uh, linked up with with police, what kind of uh, lunacy we would face. Obviously, with some people you go like, Oh, my God, he stole the packages off my door. And that's this guy or girl and they live here, etc, etc. On the other hand, with false positives, chaos reigns um especially so at 90 odd percent false we're, positives we're, yeah we're, we're at a very slippery slope in terms of how how this works socially how it works technically and and while we like the ability for a lens chip software combination to be able to help us you know when i was in china i used this kind of translation software to read signs and uh, there's a lot of comedy involved because the translation if any of you have used it is not 100 percent accurate but it gives you enough of the strange poetry of a sign to get you on your way uh, ditto identifying any kind of of material um if if you're working on an engine to identify parts or but once you start to apply it to a social dynamic, it becomes very, very frightening. Hmm. So what does all this mean then? <laughs> what does all this mean for the future of photography? <laughs> That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Well, it's, it's, it feels very dystopian idea. again. <laughs> well, yeah, that's me. That. <laughs> you know, I'm living in dystopia. So um, I, I would say that we as kind of creative forces would love to see highly accurate um, object, lens, chip, AI information 
data flow that would be really, really great. I'm not talking about facial recognition specifically, but the way machine learning can aid in creation, adjustment, um, changing, for example, I, uh, in a photograph uh, that is uh, of a house that's made of wood, if I just say I'd, I'd like that house to have a stone facade and with one button, it would recognize the house, it would identify the kind of stone that I had set and apply it perfectly, uh, grabbing that material from the web and, and creating the right material set, texture set to wrap around the building. These are things creatively that would be really kind of fun. On the other hand, walking around, um, and we don't have near as many CCTV cameras as as you guys do um but w i think we have certainly more reasons to be paranoid here or as william burroughs said uh being paranoid is just having all the facts but but so on the technical end i think we are all fascinated and embrace that on the negative end socially i think we have real problems, at least I think I speak for the group here. And so how do we resolve that in terms of our our artistic um, desires and our so, social... So let me ask you then, this is just a question that's just occurred to me. This is, so apologies for ambushing you all, but what, ha yeah, we, if we had, uh, what, well, that, that photo editing software is now coming out recently that, that says it is AI and AI is all the rage in photo editing software. What if there were, and we also of course have, um, you know, in things like phones now we have portrait lighting simulation and stuff like that. What if you had uh, an app that would change the ethnicity of a face? Is that, ethic there is, is that ethically sound? It's already there. It's already there. It's is all, it? It's oh, already okay. available. I mean, there's there there's algorithms now. I'm not sure if they are available in an app, but there's algorithms that will change dogs to cats and uh, cars to people and stuff. I mean, it's it's possible today, um, and face changers and swaps. Um, I think there's 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 enough of those already out there. Yeah, there is. So mm. it's, it's it's that's not that's not a that's not a theory. That's a practice. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah okay okay so uh, okay, so, so okay. how do we feel how do we feel about that though i mean i i'm not uh, i mean you know, i guess in t since in part it must be to do with the the use case i suppose is, is you, you can't take these things out of context but you know i mm. i feel okay about these things as long as i still recognize them to be fake because that's what is usually the case with these things you see it and then there are telltale signs that <clears throat> I don't know that the eyes look wrong or something, um, mm. but the, this stuff is becoming better by the minute, and uh, there are now proofs of concepts out there where you can do these things without a trace of a doubt that that it we don't see that it's fake anymore with uh, more and more of those. So the closer mm. it gets to becoming indistinguishable, at least for with my eyes, I might, I might still be forensic tools, I can do it, but uh, with my eyes, then um, it becomes all, uh, much more serious all of a sudden, of course, especially when it comes yeah. to wow. spreading it's, information, it, you know. Does it not get tricky very quickly? I mean, you know, this year we've seen a number of high profile voiceover actors who happen to be white, but have provided voices for an, uh, a number of different colored characters. Um, uh, have have uh, resigned their their post or their I don't know there's a post or a role or, or a job or what and said now it, you know it it you know I've come to realize it, it it's not appropriate for a white person to be voicing this character um, and that's happened in some very high profile places as well you know very high profile shows um, and so you know if, if it's if it's not even a, a, if it's not appropriate to do that at the audio level when one one could argue that it is perhaps less noticeable, especially if it's a cartoon character who's got a funny voice. Anyway, um, is is it you know do do we have do do we need to put in some controls here some 
so it, you know do we need to to have laws that then um constrain the way that software can act perhaps is, is that I, a, a, an appropriate approach I, I mean i would say that that it in and of itself is a slippery slope and we probably um uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how I would approach a show on cultural appropriation, which is um, certainly part of my work. Um, you know, the study of it and, and the engaging in, in kind of messing with whether it's genres, imagery, all of those things. Um, and I do it very hyper consciously because I think that, you know, if we're talking about cultural appropriation, I'll go off topic for a moment, but there is such fabulous beauty in cultural appropriation when it comes to music or food um, mm. uh, even with literature depending on uh, points of view but it becomes a, a bigger more um, more important discussion when it when it it really talks about how society um, um, deals with real cultural appropriation and quote, ownership of dreadlocks or kunte um, scarves and whatnot. Um, so so it, it's something that I think we as a society are coming to grips with. But going back to topic in terms of AI, um, I, I would say that, you know, I use um, Topaz AI apps. I don't use them that often. I don't, like on the gigabit, uh, gigabit you know, um, uh, I, I find it, it really it so changes the look that it, for me, looks very, very obviously uh, processed. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have its own aesthetic, but it, it does look processed. I would like it not to, uh, but does that, uh, is that a contradiction of what Chris is saying? Like if I take a tiny little Minox shot and blow it up to a billboard using that, and it looks fantastic. Um, is that a good or a bad thing? So is, this is, it's a step where, where we have technology racing ahead and, and mm. culture and society and, and a legal framework following rather sluggishly behind, isn't it? So. I, yeah. think, I think that's mm -hmm. a discussion that, um, that we should open up and have others participate as well. I mean, there's lots of people watching this, listening to this. Um, I'd like again to suggest um, to join us on our Discord because that is really the place where uh, discussions can happen in a, in a safe space. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, and uh, I'm 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 really happy about those who have already joined, and there were some discussions here and there, and some sharing of images and some stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's really. Um, one of the most important purposes for this episode is to start a discussion or to get people involved in a discussion that um, yeah. I think is necessary. Because I, I don't think we, we really understand um, uh, where this all will end, uh, on the positive and on the negative. Um, I think we're early days. We're just coming to grips with what is possible. You know, if we look at it through the prism of creativity, I say bring it all on. But if we, you know, if we look at it through the prism of of social change and and politics, I think we have a very different discussion. And so I think what you were saying is I think boundaries socially, whether it's facial re recognition tied to law enforcement and behavior, that's one thing. If it's uh, facial recognition where I can open my computer or make a purchase without throwing down a credit card and whatnot, um, I would maybe for the convenience as has been known, uh, I'd say, yeah, why not? Um, I don't know if I would say why not, but but I, I think that you could you could just I think that's coming very, very soon is our face is our wallet is our fingerprint and uh, or our eyes are that I mean, I, you know, I, I use something called clear um, here in the US, which is all very, you know, facial recognition uh, oriented. Um, I have a, a you know, global entry uh, pass, which is based on eyes and facial recognition and, and fingerprints to cross between uh, borders. I mean, coming in and out of the US um, with, you know, so I'm, I'm using my face as my passport. Um, so, 
you know, that, that often saves me hours of time. Uh, is it worth giving up that for those hours of time? Well, convenience well, is a you. very strong selling point for sure. It certainly it is. is. I mean, when I go, through, when, when I cut, if say when I when I used to, when I used to land at Heathrow Airport and and go through the the gates for UK citizens with biometric passports, and it just you know you, you scan your passport, it scans your face, and it lets you and it opens the gate and lets you in. So, um, you know that's uh, that that could be quite quite compelling, and I think a, a lot of European countries are operating those kind of systems now. But if 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 the camera doesn't recognise your face, <clears throat> what would you do then? Oh, you well, go to the bloke. You go to the bloke with the long queue, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Back of the line. Yeah. It happened basically, to me. See, yeah. that's inherently unfair. Then already, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it it happened to me. Um, so, it, yeah, several times because my photo wasn't I don't know good enough or something. Yeah on the passport the and yeah 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 i, I, I think I stood uh, in front the work of the machine, that that lady the was doing kind of sorry go ahead Imar. Me? <laughs> sorry i think that the work that that lady is doing joy uh buelamini um with her algorithmic justice league which is this kind of um place that she set up for people to um feed her information so that she can kind of generate her own data sets and you know push for you know the best version of this possible i think that's good work because it's there whether we like it or not so like you know i think it seems like a very positive step actually yeah it's she, quite she, kind she, of an she's ethical taking a positive sort of action based yeah, on what she's yeah. found in her research mm, mm. Um, um, so. I, I found that the 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 most accurate that i've experienced is uh the eye scanners very very close to the eyeballs uh, that that seems to be um, one of the biometrics that, uh, from my reading and my understanding, is extremely accurate. So what's the percentage of false positives on that then, Jeremiah? I think it's very, very low. I mean, it's like, it's like fingerprints. Yeah, they're um, unique. Yeah, and yeah. fingerprints can be manipulated. We could, we could start a whole... Why a couldn't whole they just have left it at the fingerprints? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we could start a whole other discussion about how biometrics aren't necessarily good because uh, if you have your passport, uh, if you have your password cracked, you can change your password. If you have someone steal your fingerprint uh, and, re and recreate <laughs> it, you cannot just cut off a finger or change your fingerprint. And the yeah, same is true that for all other all biometrics. The all the time. Oh, oh yeah, it's easy in movies, I know. In movies, it's <laughs> simple. You just there flip was, uh, that thing uh, on. You movie yeah, people. Wesley, Wesley Snipes <laughs> did it as well. Wesley Snipes. Um, <laughs> it's been done Demolition forever. Man. Was it Demolition Man? Where he put somebody's eye on the end of a... a prison guard's eye on the end of a pen oh. to get this kind of get out. Oh, lovely, <laughs> just, lovely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, there's, there's lots of movies. Lots of good stuff in the movies. You should, you should watch some. <laughs> oh, it's great. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I have to say that they're, they're just just a, a joke. I don't know whether it's appropriate to, to have a joke at the end of a serious conversation like this, but um, the, the joke is, of course, of, of the uh, the forensic policeman who said, "Yes, he much prefers fingerprints over eye scans." He said, "Because criminals don't tend to leave eye prints at the scene of the crime." <laughs> 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 okay, so again, I, I invite everyone who's uh, listening or watching this um, to join the discussion on our Discord. Um, and with that, I think it's time to go to the picks of the week. So who wants to start first? I'll, I'll dive in if you like. Yeah, Okay, go ahead. Adrian, uh, let me find yours. Oh, yours does not, does not have a link. It does not have a link. Mm. So um, this is my, uh, my, 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 my pick of the week is simply this week. It's pencil, not watch. Um, which are references pencil, to pencil, not watch. Pencil, not watch. Which are reference uh, references. Excuse me to to Apple products. Um, I I got an Apple Watch this week. Um, first time, first time ever. I bought the cheap one. What happened is that um, uh, the second Fitbit of of the year died. <laughs> Oh, and, okay. And actually, now, now Apple sell an old version of the Apple Watch, which is which is only a little bit more than than uh, most of the competition. Um, uh, I find though that whilst the Apple Watch is quite good at collecting statistics for health, um, I haven't found a single photography use for it yet. <laughs> oh, I'll I'll give you a few, but um, uh, well, that's it, a different episode. A, it acts as a remote shutter. I know I, I know ah, that it can yeah, act as no, a remote there's, shutter there's for the a lot camera. More. Uh, 
for the camera. And the well, if you get okay, well, if you can find for me some some good photography uses of an Apple Watch, I will be enthusiastically grateful. <laughs> <laughs> However, having said that, at the other end of the spectrum, I have been editing some pictures this week and I've particularly enjoyed um, uh, masking different layers of images uh, with the Apple Pencil. You can, it, it, it almost doesn't matter which software tool you use, you could use a dodge and burn uh, you know, to, to, to change things. You could use a mask yeah, uh, to, to draw on a mask to, to reveal and hide things. Uh, yeah, it, I just feel... It, it, it seems to me to be so much more fun and engaging and intuitive to me personally than trying to draw elliptical gradients and stuff like that. Mm. So, so there you go. Pencil not watch this week. So you've fallen in love with the Apple Pencil, is what you're saying. Again, I, I, it, it, yeah, again, I, again, I don't use it all the time, but when I do use mm. it, I fall in love with it again. Wonderful. Um, I would like to um, pour one out for the inventor of the Pixel, Russell Kirsch, who passed oh, yes, away yes, he did, this he week, did. or actually yeah, actually yeah. a few weeks ago. We are a bit late yeah. with that. Um, he was a computer scientist. He, uh, he did the first digital picture by scanning, drum scanning, uh, a picture of his son, which was 172 times 172 pixels and it was on a computer that could just hold this picture and nothing else um, and mm. we'll link to an article about him um, and there's one a very interesting thing in there um, I think with 80 he proposed to change the shape of pixels which um, makes a lot of sense when you watch that and uh, could lead to much much smaller pictures so um Truly an inventor and uh, uh, the guy who we owe a lot to, right? Oh, I, I had missed that, actually. I, um, oh, I didn't uh, see that yes. um, It looks like there's a video there to, to watch. That's with it the with one to watch mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. about the, the different approach to pixels. Square pixels are not good, according to him. And I kind of agree after watching the video. So, Oh, there maybe there's a show in that somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Possibly. Um, who wants to go next, Jeremiah? Sure. Um, mine is, uh, we were talking about AI and false positives, <laughs> the rest of it. Uh, I, I kind of uh, present an article from The Verge, um, which is a designer who has worked to use uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and Photoshop to bring ancient Roman emperors back to life. In other words, he went uh, through the web and, and uh, got all of these old statues. And he used to colorize these old statues, but then he started to use AI to actually build uh, faces out of them. And um, they are absolutely phenomenal. They're incredible. I urge everybody to take a peek at how some of these uh, Roman emperors actually looked, humanizes them in a way that um, does, yeah. is uh, quite compelling. Some That's of them look right. quite scary as well, I don't know. Don't either. they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, pick some I, I nicer it's, people. <laughs> it's sort of on point. Well, they are um, the people they made statues of. I mean, you don't have too much choice there, don't you? <laughs> no, indeed. No, indeed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, last but not least, Imar, you gave us a, an Instagram link. I got a fun one this week because I thought it might get a bit heavy. So um, ever since I've been on Instagram, this guy has been on Instagram, too. And he does art on bananas. And <laughs> some of them are just incredible. Like from really humble kind of beginnings. I think I almost remember when he began to do this. But they just get more and more elaborate over time. And just all archival, I think, right? I think he's excellent. <laughs> So, so that's that's kind but he's of. He's done a, the Last Supper, and <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So, and they're so very thematic sometimes, like depending on the time of year. They're great fun. Adrian's calendar, um, a couple of uh, shows back there, really reminded me of this instantly. Ah, kind of brings a yeah, smile to yeah. my face. I find this really they're interesting, um, espe especially <laughs> that that because it adds the second layer of art. There's the artist making his art, but then they also have to. Um, take good photos of the art. So that's the second uh, yeah. art on top of the first art, isn't it? 
we were we point. were thinking of doing a show on that, right? Um, Possibly. In other words, chick a chicken and egg kind of show, which <laughs> is, do you build something or make something to be photographed, or do you photograph something that's already in front of you? Yeah. Adrian, I think you had one of the oh, many many oh, topics okay. on our list of episodes to work on and uh, by yeah. the way just as a reminder everyone um our discord is not only there for heavy discussions but also for the lighter ones and you can help us plan future episodes that's what this thing is also for so if you want to influence where this uh this little show goes then yeah that's a good place I to think join I, us. that's a good point i personally definitely need some help the last thing i shared the last image i shared was was yesterday i happened to visit stonehenge yesterday and i was inspired to make a, a an almost slightly psychedelic photograph i didn't of it. think it was psychedelic and to be honest maybe, maybe it didn't come th maybe yeah. the, i tried to it's lighten try to to lighten the impact of the edit on it after a while but it looked um, pretty normal to me Oh, they well, looked well, so you small. You to go to the optician then. <laughs> they <laughs> looked yeah. small, like yeah. It's Just a school like for ants, movies. Jeremiah. That's what it is. It's a school for ants. <laughs> so yeah, our our show <laughs> our very showcase very channel small. our showcase channel is getting some interesting pictures posted to it. Yeah. We had a bit <laughs> of a film leaning slant f uh, there, so let's see where this will take us. Yeah. Maybe. Well, hey. So that's that. That was the uh, the the Mint Instax camera, wasn't it? The, Maybe uh, that is the future photography. But let's find out together. Um, we have all the addresses here on the screen. You can find us on Twitter at TFOP now on Instagram under the same name. Our little Discord server is, and again, if you don't know what Discord is, it's just a little community place where we can be among ourselves and uh, meet up with you and you can meet up with us. And that is at tfttf.com slash join TFOP. And we're also on the big World Wide Web at thefutureofphotography.com. And we're looking forward to seeing you again and maybe seeing you on our Discord. Until then, take care and bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.